everyone. Thank you very much to those of you who have come along to the Royal Asiatic Society this evening, and thank you to um, people who are listening in via Zoom. Um, I'll just make a very short introduction to our speaker, who I think many of you in the room will know and probably know everything I'm about to say anyway, but I'll just, for the record, um, our speaker is Dr. Bill Hayton. Um, and as I understand it, you were appointed an associate fellow, is it, of um, the Asia Pacific program at Chatham House, probably 2015? That's right. Associate fellow is code, but they don't pay me. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no more. I won't ask any more questions about that. Um, in 2019, I think you received your PhD from Cambridge um, for work on the history and development of the South China Seas dispute. Um, you're a hugely experienced journalist um, who's worked for the BBC, I think, through till 2021. And that included working for a while as the BBC's reporter in Vietnam in the mid 2000s and being seconded, as I understand it, to the public broadcaster in Myanmar more yes, recently, 2013 14. Great. So, again, really interesting. Um, Great I think. success that was. <laughs> Um, we won't hold it personally against you. Anyway, you're currently editor of um, the academic journal Asian Affairs. I un yeah, again, right. understand that. Rivals. Yeah, no worries. <laughs> and also the author of four really important books on Asia, whose titles I think underline your deep and wide ranging expertise. So if I just run through them quickly so that everyone in the room is aware of what you've written on. So the first 2010 was Vietnam. Rising Dragon. The next, it's been reissued, I think, more recently. Then the next book, The South China Sea, The Struggle for Power in Asia, 2014. Um, then The Invention of China in 2020. And most recently, A Brief History of Vietnam in 2022. And today, as it's telling us on the screen, you're speaking to us on constructing a Chinese territory, history and geography in the early 20th century. So that's that's Bill, and um, I'll hand over to you. And then at the end, I'm um, very happy. I hope to take questions. Sure. Great. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you all for coming. Um, thank you, Mr. Secretary, for being here. Um, it's a great pleasure to be speaking at the Royal Asiatic Society. And thanks to Sarah and to Alison for organising it. Um, so uh, the talk is based on uh, parts of chapters seven and eight of my book, uh, The Invention of China, which was just mentioned, uh, now available in Chinese and the mysterious language of French as well, hopefully Japanese, Thai and Vietnamese editions coming soon. And there's a few uh, English editions over there if anybody would like to do it at the end. Have to pay me some. Um, so I'm going to be talking about um, three geographers in particular. Um, and about how Chinese nationalists came to construct their ideas of national territory in the early 20th century and do that through the lives of these three men, Bai Mei Chu, Zhu Kejian, and Zhang Qiun, who represent three generations of geographical thinking and each in their own way left a legacy of geopolitical problems for subsequent generations to try and resolve. Among other things, Bai laid the foundations for a Chinese claim in the South China Sea, Zhu bought imported American racial science to Chinese geography, and Zhang Qiun became Chiang Kai-shek's advisor and advocated the retreat to Taiwan in 1949. So quite a legacy of these three people. But I need to begin really, I think, by laying some foundations myself of understanding the context for the emergence of nationalist geography. I think it's important to grasp the nature of the Qing state in the late 19th century. The most important thing, of course, being that it was a Manchu-led state ruled by an inner Asian people. And rather than talking about a Qing empire or dynasty here, I'm going to use the term coined by Tim Brook of great state. Tim argues that the Mongols invented the idea of the great state as a particular way of ruling many different peoples, tribes, and groups, and allowing them to exist within a large and flexible political arrangement, so long as they were loyal to the emperor. Tim argues that even after the Mongol great state collapsed, that way of ruling continued to be a model of government. In the early 17th century, a group of semi-nomadic tribes, whom we can call Manchu, organized themselves into a confederation which in 1635 conquered its neighbors, the Mongols. They then declared themselves to be the founders of a new great state, which they called the Qing. Then in 1644, this great state conquered the old Ming state and made it part of their empire. 
In other words, China proper, the, the Ming state, became in effect a colony of a Manchu empire and remained so until the revolution of 1912. After conquering the Ming great state, the Qing went on to conquer other Mongol areas then expand control over Tibet and what's now called Xinjiang. But it's critically under, important to understand for this talk that these areas were not part of a Chinese empire. They were incorporated into a Manchu great state. So that's the context. Now we can turn to the question of defining national territory. There had been, of course, been what might loosely be called geographical studies before the 20th century. There'd been sophisticated cartography too. Jesuit missionaries demonstrated their usefulness to the Kangxi emperor by advising his surveyors, making a map of his realm in the 1710s, for example. But at the turn of the 20th century, what was called the Shua, literally earth study, was relatively unsophisticated, at least by the standards of what was being undertaken in Europe and North America. But this would change as questions of territory became fundamental to the Chinese nationalist movement. In the first decade of the 20th century, nationalists would have to define what they wanted to call their country, who was and who was not Chinese, and therefore which bits of land should be incorporated into the new nation state. The answers to these questions were far from obvious. Territory was a particular preoccupation of the nationalist revolutionary Sun Yat-sen, Sun Zhongshan. In 1900, he commissioned a map of a future country which he called Jina, not Zhongguo or Zhonghua. Basically took the, uh, the European name and uh, or the Japanese name uh, and uh, adopted it for his, the name of his future Chinese state. Sketched out lines of railways that would enable its modernization. But the focus of his map, as you can see here, was on China proper, what he called Jina Benbu, the former provinces of the Ming state, the region of what was starting to be called the Han people. He was less interested in the rest. In accompanying notes, he divides the Qing realm into China proper, the former Ming state, and its dependencies, uh, or the Dishu, uh, Manchuria, Mongolia, Tibet, and Xinjiang, which he divides into two. He even use the words East Turkestan, which might uh, amuse some people uh, who are familiar with the Xinjiang question. Um, 1900 was, of course, a critical year for the emergence of new ideas. The Boxer Rising and the subsequent international invasion prompted a crisis of legitimacy for the Manchu ruling family and a radicalization among its critics. All this was motivated by the new ideas of social Darwinism then circulating among intellectuals and the associated fear of racial extinction. Sun followed his map with an essay the following year in the wake of the Boxer Rising and the Eight Nation Invasion, which argued that Westerners were plotting to carve up China because they were afraid that it would become as powerful as the Mongols. It's clear, however, in this essay that his vision of Jina is still focused on the provinces of the former Ming state. Radicals like him were appalled both by the failure of the Qing state to resist the foreigners, but also by the weakness of the people who surrendered, as this 1904 cartoon by Chen Duxu, later to be a founder of the Communist Party, shows. That same year, a writer, this is 1904, um, in Dongpang Zaji, an influential magazine established in Shanghai by American-trained Chinese Protestants, described this failure as national humiliation. The writer took an old idea, Guo Qi, the shame of the ruling house or of the state, and repurposed it to mean the shame of the nation or of everyone in the state. The author complained, as many others would in subsequent years, that Chinese people were apparently impervious to feelings of national shame and that this was a failing that needed to be addressed. The language of national humiliation became an important mobilizing tool for the nationalist revolutionaries. It created a sense of identity against both the foreigners and the ruling elite of the Qing state. It became a marker of belonging. To become part of the nation, a Chinese nationalist had to feel this sense of humiliation. This was the atmosphere in which the academic discipline of geography came to China. More of the intellectual work was taking place outside China in this period, I would argue, Japan being a particular center. It was probably Liang Qichao, based in Yokohama at the time, who persuaded Sun Yat-sen to take more interest in the non-Han areas of the Qing state. Liang wanted to preserve the territory of the great state, partly because he wanted to reform the existing empire, but also because he saw the other regions as necessary for the success of this reformed empire. They were rich in resources, but thinly populated. If not defended, other states, particularly Russia or British India, might take them. To legitimize the incorporation of these areas into the future Chinese state required some major intellectual innovations on Liang Zhichao's part. 
including the construction of a greater nationalism that included groups beyond the Han. Implicit within this view was the conviction that the non-Chinese inhabitants of the areas around China proper would either eventually become Chinese, either through interbreeding or by demographic domination, or they would disappear. The Han were the master race, the Zhuren, into which all the other peoples of the Qing realm would merge to form the new nation. Now, there were several words for place in Chinese, but none that equated to territory with its connotations of ownership and sovereignty. Traditional term Jiang Yu literally meant the boundary of the imperial realm. And in dynastic times, this boundary stretched as far as the emperor's authority, so in theory at least could have included tributary and vassal states. But its meaning was vague and did not imply the existence of a defined border. So a new word for territory came into Chinese from Japanese, specifically from a Japanese translation of a text by the British social Darwinist Herbert Spencer. In his 1883 translation of Spencer's Political Institutions, Tadashiro Hamano chose the two kanji characters, ryodo, literally governed land, as equivalents for territory. As president of Keio University, Hamano was an authoritative figure and his translation soon spread into widespread use. 15 years later, Liang Chichao used the same characters in his newspaper. In classical Chinese, they were, they were pronounced lingtu, but they have exactly the same meaning, governed land. Lingtu therefore carries a clear meaning of a sovereign country enclosed within a defined border. From there, the word was picked up by one of Sun Yat-sen's followers, Hu Hanmin, and used in a series of articles in the revolutionary's newspaper, Minbao, during 1904-1905. Hu was arguing that territorial sovereignty was the foundation of international law and that logically the revolutionaries needed to oppose the unequal treaties demanded by foreign powers. So in other words, the revolutionary movement's newfound territorial passions were the direct descendants of late 19th century European nationalisms. The nationalists in exile were exposed to these foreign ideas and were dreaming radical dreams, but reform-minded individuals living within the Qing great state we're attempting to meet the challenge of the new times with much older intellectual tools. A good example is our first geographer, Bai Mei Chu, later given the honorific Bai Yuheng. Bai was an ethnic Manchu himself, born into relatively humble origins in what is now Hebei province at the beginning of the Great Famine of 1876 to 79. The Sino Japanese War of 1894 5 took place when he was 18, and the Boxer Uprising when he was 24. He was part of the last generation to be trained for the old scholar bureaucracy and among the first to experience the clash between traditional ideas of geography as expressed in the ancient texts and new ideas arriving through the missionaries and the treaty ports. His family had enough money to have him privately schooled and at the age of 15, he earned the title of the first rung on the traditional ladder to exam success. But he was then sent to one of the newly established modern schools which taught both Chinese and Western subjects. In later life, he described reading the classic of mountains and seas, the tribute of Yu and the Shangshu. But these 2,000-year-old documents were a poor guide to the changes that he was witnessing all around him. Once, he might have expected to study them to pass the necessary exams to join the bureaucracy. But in September 1905, the imperial examination system was abolished. Instead, that same year and at the age of 29, Bai enrolled at the Beiyang Normal School, whose purpose was to train teachers for a new reformed education system. He became a school teacher and then a teacher of teachers at the women's normal school in Tianjin. There he taught, among others, Deng Yingchao, the future wife of uh, Zhou Enlai. But at the same time, he was becoming a pioneer in the new subject of geography. This was not yet modern geography, but a hybrid of old ideas and new nationalisms. In 1909, he became one of the founders of what I think we should translate as, rather than geography, as the China Earth Study Society here. Uh, according to Zeki Hon, none of these members had any professional training. There were people like Bai who had once expected to join the scholar bureaucracy, but were now struggling to adapt. Many of them found less prestigious jobs teaching in secondary schools and girls' schools. Members of the China Earth Study Society were profoundly influenced by social Darwinism. In the first issue of their journal, they collectively declared, the cause of the rise and fall of power is due to the, ge the level of geographical knowledge of each group. Thus, the level of geographical knowledge has a direct impact upon a country and it can cause havoc to a race. It is indeed a manifestation of the natural law of selection based on competition. The only way to regain national strength, they argued, was to master geography. In Bai's words, loving the nation 
is the top priority in learning geography while building the nation is what learning geography is for. We'll come back to Bai in a while. But who was part of the nation that Bai was talking about and who was not? Were the Manchu ruling elite part of it or did they need to be expelled to create a pure Han Chinese nation? Some radicals were prepared Given the, given the joke away there. Um, some radicals were uh, determined, were prepared to cede the peripheral territories of the Qing Great State in order to create a pure Han state in the heartland of China proper, the former Ming state. Others, including Sun Yat-sen, were determined to ensure that the Republic inherited all of the territory of the former empire, the non-Chinese areas, if you like, Manchuria, Mongolia, Tibet, and Xinjiang, uh, made up more than half its territory and contained vital natural resources. These questions were, were vexed, and they even resulted in massacres during the 1911-1912 revolution. The choice is made obvious in this photograph taken at a critical juncture in the revolution. We have Sun Yat-sen standing in front of the, the tomb of the first Ming emperor on the day that the Qing emperor has abdicated. He is positioning himself as the historical equivalent of, 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 of Zhu Yuanzhang, having expelled the Tartars from China. The flag on his left, on, on our left, uh, has 18 stars to represent each of the provinces of the old Ming state. But the flag on the right is what becomes the new Republic of China flag. The politics of the revolution ended up with the new republic becoming the state of the five races. With the inhabitants of each of the script areas being given a stripe on the national flag. Despite these rhetorical commitments to ethnic equality and national unity, the Republic, however, quickly disintegrated. Tibet and Mongolia and Xinjiang becoming de facto independent states. Then within a few years of the revolution, even China proper was divided between warlords with the writ of central government limited to a small area. Nonetheless, the national dream endured. The result was a constitution that specifically described the territory of the state, perhaps the first constitution ever to do so. The provisional constitution approved by Sun Yat-sen's government in March 1912 set out in relatively precise detail what it believed the territory of the Republic should be. It said, in effect, that the new state inherited the boundaries of the Qing Great State as they stood when the revolution broke out. Article 3 simply stated the territory of the Chinese Republic consists of 22 provinces, Inner and Outer Mongolia and Tibet. But the choice of 22 provinces is highly significant since Taiwan was the 23rd. Given that the constitution text was still laying claim to outer Mongolia, despite its declaration of independence three months earlier, Tibet, despite the ongoing insurrection there, and Xinjiang, despite its de facto independence at the time, this seems to be clear proof that the Republic had formally abandoned any claim to Taiwan. However, in 1914, when Yuan Shikai, the general who forced Sun Yat-sen from office, imposed a new constitutional compact on the country, the definition of the national territory was changed. Article three became the apparently tautological, the territory of the Chinese Republic remains the same as the domain of the former empire. New words notwithstanding, the 1914 constitutional definition of territory merely begged a further question about the exact extent of the domain of the empire. And the arguments went backwards and forwards in different versions of the constitution over the next couple of decades. The last Republican constitution promulgated before the end of the civil war doesn't even attempt to define the national territory. This shows how difficult it was to answer the fundamental questions about the nature of the state and what claims should be made. Nationalist modernizers had thought there was a simple answer to these questions based on the view of borders they'd acquired through contact with foreign powers and experts. The reality was far from simple. Attempting to answer these questions became the work of people like our second geographer, Zhu Kujen, in the aftermath of the Boxer Rising, the United States government had demanded reparations of $25 million from the Qing, a sum which even its own diplomats regarded as excessive, perhaps twice as much as the actual damage suffered by American citizens and their government during the violence. Over the course of the 1900s, pressure rose on Theodore Roosevelt's administration to do something to alleviate the huge burden of debt imposed on the Qing. By 1909, a compromise emerged, the excess around $11 million was to be put into the put into a fund to pay for the education of Chinese students, the Boxer Indemnity Scholarships. And Zhu was the 28th recipient of one of these scholarships. In 1910, at the age of 20, he arrived at the University of Illinois to study agronomy. 
but after receiving his degree, he enrolled for a PhD in meteorology at Harvard. There, his supervisor was Robert de Courcy Ward, America's first professor of climatology. But Ward's views went much wider than the weather. In 1894, he had co-founded the Immigration Restriction League, and his academic opinions combined meteorology with eugenics. He believed that climate determined civilization. He claimed that in the seasonality of the temperate zone of the planet, in his words, lies much of the secret, how much of it, of the energy, ambition, self-reliance, industry, thrift of the inhabitant. In the tropics, by contrast, he argued the climate was enervating and progress towards higher civilization is not reasonably to be expected. As a result, it was entirely justified in Ward's view for white people from the temperate zone to develop the tropical areas of the globe, even with slave labor if necessary. But he was particularly impressed with the ability of Chinese coolie labor to work in all conditions. But Zhu seems to have lapped up these theories, gained his PhD and returned to China in 1919 to become the first professor of geography at the Normal University of Wuchang, moving to Southeastern Normal University in Nanjing the following year. Ward's environmental determinism gave a new scientific basis to the prevailing Han racism of the time and helped to set the parameters for the emerging discipline of geography in the Republic of China. According to Zhu, China's temperate latitude had blessed its people with an intermediate skin color and an unusually strong ability to adapt to all kinds of environments. In his reasoning, and this is his words, people who are used to tropical climates cannot bear winter in the temperate zone. Those, are, those who are used to temperate climates cannot stand tropical or frigid weather. But we Chinese are exceptional. No matter how hot or cold an environment is, there are Chinese footprints. When the Panama Canal was excavated, only our Chinese people kept working tirelessly and efficiently when foreign workers couldn't even work. This is why foreigners call the Chinese the yellow peril. This is also a ray of morning sunshine for us Chinese in the future. Those are his words. Now, among Zhu's many students at Nanjing during the 1920s was our third geographer, Zhang Qiyun. Over the following three decades, Zhang would personify the search for China's national territory. He would help to define it, propagate it, survey it, advise the government on securing it, and then ultimately to flee it. Zhang Qiyun joined Zhu Kejian's first ever geography class in 1920. He graduated three years later and joined the staff of the commercial press in Shanghai, where the brother of one of his classmates was an established editor. The editor was a man called Chen Bulei, who would also go on to play a major role in nationalist politics. Together, Zhang, Chen, and Zhu formed an influential clique at the intersection of academia, journalism, and propaganda. Together, the trio brought geography into the center of Chinese political thinking and put it at the service of the Kuomintang's nationalist mission. Zhang spent the next four years writing the geography textbooks used in most Chinese schools during the late 1920s and beyond. His memoirs show that Zhu was a strong influence on their content. Then, after Chen Bulei became the editor of the country's third largest newspaper by circulation, Shangbao, he commissioned Zhang to write commentaries on geographical topics. In 1927, on Zhu's recommendation, Zhang was appointed a geography lecturer at Zhongyang University in Nanjing. The next 10 years, the Nanjing decade, was a time of profound change in both the politics and the educational systems of the Republic of China. The Kuomintang captured Nanjing and Shanghai in early 1927, and within 18 months, the party was nominally in control of the whole country. With Chiang Kai-shek installed as chairman, the nationalist government began to impose its vision of national unity on the country, a vision that was predicated on the idea of a homogenous nation. This new nationalism determined the Republic's entire approach to the border question and the situation of minorities living in the frontier area. In the view of the new government, the frontier had to be saved by making sure its inhabitants became loyal citizens of the Republic. This was particularly important because during this period, Japanese officials were highlighting the ethnic differences within the former Qing Great State that argued that those groups had a right to self-determination and to secede from the Republic from a republic dominated by another ethnic group. They claimed to be upholding this principle as they, in effect, annexed Manchuria in 1931 and encouraged separatism in Mongolia and Xinjiang. The question of territory had still not been resolved by the time Chiang Kai-shek's Kuomintang took power in 1927. Geography as an academic subject became a crucial tool for the Kuomintang seeking to win the allegiance of the public. And a crucial role was played by the clique. They put geography at the service of the party's national mission. In 1928, 
the director of the Nanjing government's Ministry of Propaganda, Dai Jitao, who was simultaneously president of uh, Zhongshan University in Guangzhou, called for the establishment of geography departments at all the country's major universities, arguing that they would play a vital role in national defense. The first was established in 1929 at Zhongyang University, where Zhang was already on the staff. Over the following eight years, geography departments were established at nine other major universities. Most of them were staffed by former students of Zhu Kujian. The output of these departments was dedicated to serving the states, the state and its frontier mission. In 1928, just after the establishment of the national government, the party, the Kuomintang Party, convened the first national conference on education. It resolved to adopt a new national curriculum for schools. From the following year, all schools were expected to imbue their pupils with strong feelings of patriotism, mobilized in particular through the teaching of history and geography. Pupils were expected to study the various regions of the country in order to foster the national spirit. A major contribution to this patriotic education movement was the series of textbooks written by Zhang Qiyun. In 1928, the commercial press published one as Ben Guo De Li, Our Geography. Its key message was that China formed a natural unit despite its enormous size and variety. But this textbook was deeply imprinted with racial chauvinism. One part of the book's message to its millions of young readers was that the country was on a journey from barbarism to civilization, and that the wild frontier where the minorities lived needed to be tamed and developed. The book included a table of various ethnic groups showing how assimilated they were to the main body, the Zhu Ti of the Han. In a description of the Miao people of the Southwest, Jiang wrote, they maintain the customs of great antiquity and are totally incompatible with the Han people eliminating their barbarism and changing their customs and habits as the responsibility of the Han people. For Zhang, the Han provided the norm against which the other groups needed to be measured in order to judge their level of civilization. He shared Zhu Kujian's opinion that climate was the determining factor in the spread of civilization. In his 1933 textbook, he observed that in the, southwest of Yunnan, the southwestern Yunnan province, the native population lived in the hot and humid lowlands while the Han people lived on the cooler plateaus. In the mountains of the Northwest, on the other hand, the Han lived in the valleys where it was warm, while the natives lived at altitudes where it was colder. It was only natural, therefore, that the temperate dwelling Han people, free of degenerating environmental influences, should exert their influence over the minorities. Other textbooks made the same point, stressing Sun Yat-sen's arguments that the Han made up 90% of the country's population, and that it was only natural that the other groups would assimilate. Yet the whole that Jiang portrayed in the textbook was a territory that in reality did not exist. The simple black line marking the national boundary encompassed huge areas that were not actually under the control of the government, the independent states of Mongolia and Tibet. Jiang portrayed them as natural parts of the Republic, nonetheless. How reality would be reconciled with the map was not explained to the pupils. Remarkably, given present day politics, there was a significant omission from Jiang's map uh, Taiwan was not drawn in the same uh, colors as the rest of the country. Sometimes it's not even printed, as you can see on the right. Zhang and the other authors of the books were nationalists who sought to evince emotions of loyalty to a state and its territory in the hearts of their young audiences. But they faced a problem that was deeply political. How could they persuade a child in a big coastal city, for example, to feel any connection with a sheep herder in Xinjiang? Why should they even have a connection? They found two main ways to do so. One group of textbook authors simply stated that all Chinese citizens were the same. They were the members of a single yellow race and a single nation, and no further explanation was needed. A second group, however, acknowledged that different groups did exist, but were nonetheless united by something greater. Within this group, some authors made use of yellow race ideas, some used the idea of a shared civilizing culture, while others stressed the naturalness of the country's physical boundaries. The most poetic technique was simply to compare the shape of the imagined country to that of a begonia or a mulberry leaf turned on its side. The port of Tianjin became the petiole of the leaf, with a central vein running west as a line of symmetry all the way to Kashgar in Xinjiang and beyond. The symmetry only made sense, of course, if Outer Mongolia and Tibet were included and Taiwan was excluded. The historians Robert Culp and Peter Zarrow have documented many examples of other geography textbooks which use different, sometimes contradictory arguments and analogies to persuade students of the naturalness of the Republic's putative borders. An ever-present theme 
in these textbooks was the threat of foreigners eating away at the country's edges. It was reinforced through school lessons about territory lost during the previous century. Teachers could make use of a peculiarly Chinese form of nationalist cartography, the map of national humiliation. Dozens of such maps were published during the 1910s, 20s, and 30s, sometimes within textbooks and atlases, and sometimes as posters for display in classrooms and public buildings. They typically portrayed, often in bright colors, land conceded to neighboring states over the previous century. There was a clear political purpose behind the making of these maps. They served to delegitimize the Qing dynasty by demonstrating its failure to defend the country and thereby to legitimize the revolution. But they also deliberately generated a sense of anxiety about the vulnerability of the nation's border in order to promote loyalty to the new republic. It seemed to work on a young Mao Zedong. He later told the American journalist Edgar Snow that hearing about national humiliation turned him into an activist. But it wasn't just Mao. This was the birth of a national territorial neurosis. The geographers took the nationalist idea of territory, cling to, and projected it back to the time of domain when there were few fixed borders. The idea that at the time these, at the time they were lost, these territories might have been contested areas with no clear allegiance to any particular empire was not part of the lesson. They were presented simply as Chinese lands that had been stolen. The authors called on the young citizens reading this textbook to do what they could to recover all this lost territory. But did this mean this lost territory should be included within the rightful boundary of the state or not? Was the shape of the country at that time natural or not? These questions weren't even posed in the textbook, let alone answered. What was important for the authors was to encourage students to feel the sense of loss, a collective sense of national humiliation, and thereby to develop a patriotic attachment to the country. The anxiety was compounded because no one, not even the geographers, knew where the borders actually were. The historian Diana Lowry has shown how in the southwestern province of Guangxi, the exact line of the border was almost irrelevant. Although it had been formally agreed with the French colonial rulers of Indochina in 1894, as far as Republican officials were concerned, the border was just somewhere in the mountains, high, remote, and difficult to reach. The state had generally managed minority groups in the Southern Highlands through a system known as Tusi, in which local leaders were responsible for the actions of their people. Borders were largely irrelevant. So long as they didn't trouble the authorities, the mountain peoples were generally left alone. In Larry's words, the Chinese world stopped well before the borderlands. But the dream of a national territory endured. This map, one of the biggest, um, purportedly of the Republic of China, was published by Shunbao, one of the biggest selling newspapers in the country, based in the international settlement of Shanghai in 1936. But when it was published, it was a triumph of imagination over reality. In 1936, Tibet was independent, Xinjiang was ruled by a pro-Soviet warlord, Mongolia was a de facto Soviet republic, and Manchuria was a Japanese puppet state. Even parts of the area that claimed to be loyal to the republic were divided between rival regimes. So this is a map of aspiration, but it's presented as a representation of reality, or at least of the rightful state of affairs in the eyes of the publisher. The preface to the atlas, and it's, it's in the SOAS library if you want to go and look at it, uh, it tells us more about how it came to be drawn. It tells us that in 1930, Shunbao was planning how to mark its 60th anniversary a couple of years later, and decided to make a celebratory journey around the frontiers of the country. Publishers asked two well-known members of the National Geological Survey of China to lead the effort. According to the preface, one of them said, if we want to organize a successful research trip, we first need a map and studies. But since the reigns of the Kangxi and Qianlong emperors, geographers have produced maps of parts of China but no one has yet drawn a complete and accurate map of the entire country. Before we organize the trip, we should therefore first work on sketching a map of China. In other words, not even these experts knew where the borders of China were. The government felt something had to be done. Zhang Qiyun's work on, oh, sorry, uh, yeah. Zhang Qiyun's work on geography textbooks had brought him to the attention of the Kuomintang leadership. On the 1st of November 1932, he became one of the 40 or so founding members of the government's National Defense Planning Commission, created in response to the Japanese invasion of Manchuria in September 1931, and also to counter increasing unrest in Xinjiang. Its primary purpose was to advise on strategic issues, such as military preparedness and the economy. Zhang was given two roles on the commission, evidence of the dual roles played by geographers during the period. 
Initially, he was placed in charge of preparing the country's geography textbooks with a mission to inculcate the youth with the right values for national survival. Under Zhang, the geography, the, the geography curriculum became more explicit, emphasizing the need to protect China's territorial integrity. In 1933, the new geography broke from the old with the formation of a new society, albeit with a very similar name. The clue is in the addition of an additional character. Uh, Di Shui becomes Di Li Shui, with Li carrying the meaning of science. To this day, the China Geographical Society claims its ancestry from 1909, although actually it actually comes from the second society that, come, that emerged in 1933. This new society, founded in Nanjing, represented a break with the idea of studying everything under the sun, Earth study, towards a more circumscribed body of knowledge known as Earth science. It split geographers from geology, meteorology, and other branches of natural science. It also represented a new scientific nationalism distinct from the old imperial legacy. Then in September 1934, Zhang Tiyun was deployed as head of geography for a two year long investigation of the country's northwestern frontier, the provinces of Shaanxi, Gansu, Ningxia, and Qinghai. It was an academic mission with strategic importance. With Tibet having achieved de facto independence and Xinjiang ruled by warlords, the Nanjing government needed to know whether the surrounding provinces might also try to break away. The geographers were also tasked with drafting a plan for the economic development of the region to connect it more closely to the heartland. This was the context in which the Shunbao Atlas was commissioned and drawn. But this was not the only atlas published at this time. Another would have a legacy that upsets Asia to this day. In 1929, Bai Mei Chu had lost his teaching post at Beijing Normal University and moved to the women's equivalent. In 1935, he left university teaching altogether. He came across the program for national reconstruction that Sun Yat-sen had published in 1920 during Sun's time in the political wilderness. From Bai's own account, this book inspired him to devote his remaining years to Sun's mission, using geography to enable national reconstruction. In 1936, Bai published his new Atlas of Chinese Construction, which absorbed all the elements of the nationalist geography over the previous 30 years to produce this map of the rightful boundaries of the nation. Its most significant innovation is the line descending all the way to near the coast of Borneo in the South China Sea. The problem is that these features that he outlined don't actually exist. Many shoulders underwater, so many banks are banks, so many seahorse banks. He took British maps and he put them in the Philippines and invented islands in the place of underwater features and then drew a line around them. This is the origin of the South China Sea disputes, this bad map here. Two of his pupils uh, were um, seconded into the Chinese Ministry of the Interior in 1946 to advise the post-war government on the territorial claims that it should make. Um, and they took this line directly into Chinese government decision-making in 1946, which is why we have the South China Sea disputes today. On the 28th of August, 1938, Chiang Kai-shek gave a speech to the first graduation ceremony for his Central Training Corps, a paramilitary organization intended to indoctrinate army officers and senior civil servants in the city of Hankou. He told his audience, if our people do not know the glory of our national history, how can they fully perceive our humiliation today? If they are not familiar with the geography of the nation, how can they find the resolve to restore our lost territory? From today forward, we must not tread this disastrous path any longer. We absolutely must give special emphasis to history and geography education to stimulate the citizens' patriotic spirit to defend the country and launch our people's brilliant and dazzling new destiny. That year, the curricula of, of, uni of universities and then middle and high schools were revised to include more history and geography to, in the words of the education ministry, stimulate students' determination and resolve to rejuvenate our national people. Those of you who are familiar with the recent speeches of Xi Jinping may recognize this term, the rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. It starts here. And the final legacy maybe in Chiang Kai-shek's uh, book, uh, China Destiny, is his views on the strategic necessity of holding on to the whole boundaries of uh, the, the Qing state. It's also during the Second World War that, uh, uh, particularly 1942, that uh, the Kuomintang and Chang start to think about Taiwan again uh, in the context of thinking about the post-war situation and, and Japan's defeat. But what's important to Chiang Kai-shek 
is that these outer areas are required to defend the core. So his thinking goes right the way back to Sun Yat-sen's idea of there being a core China and dependencies upon it. So you can see clearly here, talks about uh, Manchuria, Mongolia, Xinjiang, and Tibet are a fortress essential for the nation's defense and security. So it's a, it's a way of looking at these ideas as bulwarks against outside interference, protecting a core China. Um, for defense and also for the natural resources um, that, are, that can be found there. So what we end up with as a consequence of this is that the Chinese Republic turns the Qing great state inside out. So from being uh, poor China, Ming China, whatever, uh, China proper being a, in effect, a, a dependency of a Ming great state, that, that that dependency takes over the whole Qing empire, um, Qing great state, um, and makes it subject to a Chinese view of the world. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for that. Um, I think Alison's about to do some technical wizardry. All right. Let's just give you a minute. All right, okay. And, um... Great. So um, you took us on a real sort of core, let's just say, of 50 or so years of, of obviously really important developments in China. I wonder if there are questions in the room. I hope that people online can also hear um, any questions that come from the floor. So I open it up to questions if, if um, you would like to. Please do, yes. <laughs> Um, I've, I've heard of the Asian society, for you, this is a surprise. And Americans and Chinese are talking about it. The difference is that one is our commercial basis. Um, the other one is that the difference is that the Chinese definition of the territory is aspirational, as to put it. Uh, but the American way of doing it is first to grab the territory and then include it in their map. Is that correct? Yes. Which is not a bad thing. I mean, they took Mexico, uh, New Mexico, Texas, Southern California, and something from Canada. Which one is better? <laughs> the other, I think the Chinese way wise. I guess you probably have to, you know, can, can you, would it be possible to top up the human suffering involved, you know, the American frontier, the 1950 invasion of Tibet, uh, what's happening in Xinjiang now? Uh -huh. um, yes. Uh, we're in set up accounting, I think. Uh, but you're right, I mean, yes, you know, you had aspiration that and knowledge, I suppose, uh, on the Chinese side, you had map making um, in the 20th century. Whereas I suppose with the American frontier, you, you know, there wasn't the map, you know, the map was made through the settling and the, and the expansion um, and all the rest of it. Um, I mean, who was making these maps? I mean, a lot of them, you know, they were, there was, you know, they were, uh, Qing maps that we inherited, but the, you know, for example, Bai Mei Chu's map um, um, that I mentioned at the end of the South China Sea, it's clear that he copied foreign maps, you know, that's where his knowledge came from, he didn't, you know, survey it himself. Um, so, yes, I mean, in terms of, you know, I'm not sure more <laughs> better or worse in this case, but what I think the important thing is to understand that the same ideas about frontier and racial hierarchy and all the rest of it are informing, you know, both of those frontier movements. Just one more. Yeah. Um, when, when they make this aspirational marks and then try to realize them, the Chinese way is not racist. All they want is you become like us. But next thing they started with the same color. Is that correct? Or I'm well, calling myself, but actually I know Chinese and partly Chinese. And some of us don't really like to look at other people as equal. But, um, is that a, a, a great part of the Chinese perception of what you are, the racial as opposed to cultural? Yeah, it's probably a whole other lecture in terms of thinking about qua and the idea of civilization and raising yourself up to your standard of civilization and how in the early, the late 19th, early 20th century, you get uh, a transition to more race-based thinking under the influence of European ideas and how that is absorbed and integrated into state policy. Now, I mean, it's interesting that 
when you look at communities that left, uh, let's call it China, before and after 1900, the communities that left before refer to themselves as Hua, Hua Ren, you know, Hua people, Hua Chao, or whatever. But people who leave after 1900 talk about themselves as being Han. And that's because Han becomes a defining racial you know, base for Chinese identity. You know, when you know, Cheng Bin Lin starts to use this term to define Han Manchu in that, in that period. Um, maybe that's too strong, but I mean, there's, there's definitely a change between a culture approach to difference and a racial approach around the Chinese period in the late 1930s. I think the legacy continues. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I thought it was a fascinating lecture, <laughs> full of paradoxes. I mean, the, the, the paradox to me, the uh, most emphatic one, was uh, that you emphasized that the notion of the unit of the state was very much a feature of Shanghai Shakespeare. That, in fact, the divisions within China were not emphasized. On the contrary, you were. Uh, the, the stress was on creating a unit of state. Uh, and, and that actually was contradictory to the initial impetus, it seems to me, that was brought by Mao and the party when they took over, because they were to a very large extent still universalistic in terms of their aspirations for a communist society, international society. So that the ethnic minorities initially under the Chinese constitution had a great deal of autonomy. And indeed, in the time first, I visited China in the 1980s, and at that time it was emphasized that the minorities were not entitled to have two children mm -hmm. in order to ensure that they sustained themselves as minorities. In other words, the image or vision of the USSR was still very important for China at that time. Now, obviously, there's been a, a decline from that position, uh, and, and uh, it gets more and more akin to the Chiang Kai-shek vision, I would say, today. But I, I do think that contrast, uh, I don't know whether you would agree with me on that, that, that there was big contrast between Mao's initial concept of China as a multinational nation and Chiang Kai shek's notion of a unitary state. And, um, am I overstressing that? Well, I think that these two agendas have been there from the beginning and are there now, and have been there all the way through. So the idea of, you know, how do we create a homogenous Chinese nation? How do we respect it? Um, and it's kind of probably easiest to see in the in the Chinese word Minzu. How do you translate the word Minzu? Because there is a single Donghua Minzu, a single Chinese nation, but there are also 56 different Minzu. Yes, yeah, China. Okay. Yeah. So Minzu comes into Chinese through Japanese from the Swiss German political theorist um, Johann Bunchli, who has who writes in German about the difference between folk and nation. Okay, so that when Liang Chichao is trying to think about these national questions, minorities and, and how groups form nations and, and how, they, you know, how they can be incorporated into states, what do you do about groups that straddle boundaries, he takes his inspiration from Bluntry. And so Liang Chichao comes up with a way of thinking about greater nationalism, which incorporates lots of different groups within a single minzu. But Sun Yat-sen is... His original motivation is anti manchu <clears throat> When he forms the, uh, you know, the Xinjiang Hui, Hui, the revived China society in Hawaii in 1894 5, he makes them all pledge the same to drive out the Tartars, the same pledge that the Ming made uh, to get rid of the Mongols in the 14th century. So he sees his mission as getting rid of the Manchu. <clears throat> so initially, he's a, he's a, he's a Han nationalist. If, you know, before his time. But Liang Chichao persuades him that if you want a strong country with resources and space, 
you have to have this territory, so therefore you have to include the minorities in a way. His answer is that these minorities, there will be a smelting, and he uses the American model that you can sort of smelt all the difference out of everybody and you can make everybody Chinese. Um, so this kind of, but there is, at the same time, there were Manchu uh, activists active in Japan who wanted to preserve difference and the space for you know, different groups to have their identity. And so the compromise that comes out of the 1912 revolution to stop the massacres, and also because the Manchu still control quite a lot of armed force, is that you have the Republic of the Five Races, where you have these five groups, you know, Manchu, Han, with a and each of them gets a strike on the flag. But as soon as Chiang Kai-shek uh, you know, establishes the national government in 1928, he changes the flag, the flag that you see now with the blue and, and the, with the white sun on the blue, and uh, and that in effect is a smelted flag. That's single Chinese John Pai Minzu flag. Um, now, of course, along comes the communist movement, and very much under the influence of Stalin's national policies and the idea of national self-determination and all the rest of it, they make a big play for the lives of the ethnic groups. They, you know, um, as you say, give them the paper copies to succeed from the state and all that kind of stuff in the same way that the Soviet Union does. Um, and that obviously helps them win the Civil War, but as soon as they get into power, of course, the reality, they, they become smelters. And, you know, part of the Cultural Revolution is a kind of, you know, and what happens in Tibet is kind of you know, smelting out difference, creating a homogenous nation. There's then a, a backpack against that. And one of the people who works to reverse that smelting policy and respect autonomy and give greater rights to minorities is um, Xi Jinping's father. He is friends with the Dalai Lama. He kind of works with the Tibetans, uh, in, encourages autonomy and all the rest of it. And yet now we have the sun as a smelter, you know, putting a million people in Xinjiang into detention camps, you know, kind of, you know, crushing difference in Tibet, all the rest of it. So, you know, the five ident identifications of Xi Jinping. So this kind of, you know, kind of policy pendulum between respecting difference and smelting difference out has gone backwards and forwards for the best part of a century. Thank you very much. <laughs> Is this fickle linking to across the period of government for the ethnic groups in the numbers in these Um, I mean, they are counted. Um, is it Thomas Malani who has a book on how the anthropologists were used in the 50s, you know, to count the groups, to classify them, to put them into certain groups, why certain people were, you know, certain people were classified together, other people were split up? You know, there are plenty of models. You know, the British did this, you know, the French, the Americans, everyone's done it. Um, but the Vietnamese, for example, decided they were going to have 54 groups because they couldn't have any more than the Chinese. Um, and so they kind of came up with an arbitrary number of 54, which was too late. You know, these are kind of bureaucratic, Stalinistic decisions that were taken in the, in the 50s. So, um, yes, you know, in theory, the state knows exactly how many people belong to these groups because it's written on their identity cards. But what do those identity cards really mean other than, than bureaucrats? Yeah. Just um, um, gentlemen, I actually saw it myself in 1967 when I went there. We looked at the over and the president said, We don't see what the hell are you doing up there. And I really saw that the universalist element. I, being a young man, wanted to be in the military camp, so I went to the division outside Beijing. And I stayed there and, you know, um, the rifle practice and everything. And all around me were applicants. Because, you know, there's a definite Asian, you know, <clears throat> not very friendly with darker peoples, but there they were. There was a universalist society. Mm -hmm. um, we slept in the same barracks, black, white, brown, yellow, whatever. I, I wasn't a soldier, by the way. I was just a, it was just a kid. Mm -hmm. But, you know, if you were in Tibet, this idea of homogenization would have been that we will make you like the rest of us. You know, it wouldn't have been about, you know, it wasn't about making Han Chinese more Tibetan. It was about going the other way. Mr. at the back, yeah. yeah. Thank you very much for an interesting lecture. Um, if I may sneak in two questions. So the first is I'm curious about uh, why the Qing Great State era is the high point of nation making for China because culturally it's always 5,000 years this, 5,000 years that. So why are sort of four and a half thousand years skipped over in that context? Um, and my second question 
which goes beyond the scope of, of this timeline. But uh, Russia, um, I'm just curious if you have any thoughts on Russia, because historically, end of the 19th century, some various contested areas of China that were chipped away by the Russians. And I'm curious whether you have any view from a more modern perspective on uh, is there ever a situation where China would like uh, some bits of Russia? Okay, I mean, on the back that many years of history, um, you can trace the origins of that narrative to the emergence of uh, Han nationalism, Han identity, and how do you trace the Han back and um, using kind of ideas of lineage, family lineage, how do you differentiate between the Han and the Manchu? Because this was a reaction to the whole idea of yellow race, where Manchu and Han and Japanese and everybody were part of the same you know, race in the terms of the time. And yet yeah, the revolutionaries come along and say, well, our mission has to be to overthrow the Manchu, but how are we going to determine the difference between these people? Well, the Han are the children of the Yellow Emperor, and we date the Han to you know, 5,000 years ago. So that's the kind of origin, that's where this 5,000 years comes from originally. Um, there's also another theory that um, uh, some Chinese leader went to uh, um, Egypt. We talked about 3,000 years, and they said, well, we've got to have more than that. So they were they um, So, uh, you know, that, that's kind of, you know, that, that's part of it. But I mean, um, yeah, I mean, don't, you know, don't all populated places have a long history of many thousands of years? You know, I mean, you know, I mean even in Britain, you know, we have people here 5,000 years ago. Does that mean we've got 5,000 years? Um, in terms of Russia, I mean, yes, it's obviously the border was only finally delineated, um, uh, you know, quite was it, 19, when they finally shipped out the Amber River. But I mean, what's in if you go back and you look at this? I mean, there was a piece in The Economist um, last week, I think it was, about um, how Chinese rules uh, required that atlases put the Chinese names of certain cities like Vladivostok. You know, when they print an atlas, they also have the Chinese name underneath. But of course, this is a complete, you know, mis you know, misinterpretation of the past because the, you know, the, these were inner Asian states; these were contested places; these were Manchu, Jurchen, you know, places. Um, you know, the um, the Treaty of Nerchinsk, which you know was the first to sort of settle a boundary uh, along the Amur River, um, was between the Manchu, the Qing, you know, great state, and Russia, and it was negotiated by Jesuits on both sides. Yeah, so the, the Jesuits who were working for the Manchu and the Jesuits who were working for the Russian Tsar met in the Chinsk, negotiated in Latin between them, and translated the resulting you know, treaties into Manchu and Russian, and agreed a European style boundary frontier between them. So it was a kind of way that these two empires or great states managed to resolve their conflict between them in the 17th century by using European techniques of border delineation. Um, I haven't really checked this out, but I, I, I have heard that that treaty was kept secret, you know, kind of, um, you know, to form their own population because, you know, it conflicted with the Chinese idea of the emperor ruling, you know, everything under heaven, but the Manchu would come up with their own idea of kind of having a border peace with the Russians. Um, and so they understood that there was a boundary, but it was not widely shared um, with the Chinese population, which was easy to do because um, Han Chinese people were not allowed to live in Manchuria until you know, the very end of the Qing. And so those kinds of didn't come into conflict. I may have slightly mucked that up, but that's, that's the basic, basic outcome. Can I, can I just follow up and then I'll come to you? Um, yeah. In a way, following on from that, that question, yes. So, <laughs> Cold, yeah, <laughs> it's another 200 years. Um, yes, I just wondered. Obviously, you've told us about how how sort of politically relevant geography became in this period, and you've hinted at you know how, how geography as a discipline remains obviously mm -hmm. important. But I just wondered if you could tell us maybe a bit more about how where you see geographers and and geographic knowledge almost playing out in the current context that we're part of. So obviously you've referenced Taiwan from time to time and you've mentioned obviously Vlad, Vladivostok being written in, you know. Yes. I just wonder where geography is now in terms of its... Um, no, but it's, it's, it's a question of national security. Yes. I mean, it's, it's deeply um, political in the, in the, in the, 
what he says, I suppose. Um, it's, I mean, I, I mean, having, I mean, I've, I've written about the South China Sea more than other topics. Um, and these whole questions of you know, asserting ownership and um, backdating that ownership um, are as live now as they've ever been more more. Um, and so you see you know, funding for um, centers for boundary studies in Chinese universities, you know, which are leaping up ever, you know, ever more academics who are kind of being paid now to sort of you know, backdate Chinese claims. Um, and they come up, you know, when they, you know, their latest wheeze is to go around naming underwater features in the South China Sea, which haven't been named before as a means of asserting ownership. So, yeah, um, or looking at boundary delimitation, uh, delimitations in the Himalayas, you know, on the, on the active with, with India there. Um, so, yes, there are no prizes, I think, in Chinese academia for saying, hold on, I think you might have got this wrong. Um, and, you know, always there are, you know, big rounds of compromise. But do you think yeah. there are geographers who are as well-placed or as close to place to keep the colleagues as you've described? Oh, I see. You know, um, I just wonder what, what leverage you're about, perhaps. Or is that is it so institutionalized now? That's a good question, actually. Um, I mean, I think it's more that the geographers, I mean, I haven't really looked at this, but I, I think they're more they're being instructed and they know the line. You know, national rejuvenation requires you know national reunification, um, and that requires you know, Taiwan to come back, everything within the line being uh, being included, okay. including the city. Thank you. You have yeah. a question? So, Taiwan. Mm -hmm. um, at which point does the Chinese Communist Party become so fixated on Taiwan, given that, as you say, um, the Kuomintang era maps, they didn't seem all that keen to reclaim Taiwan from the Japanese? Uh, 1942 was the answer. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, in obviously, obviously, the attack on Pearl Harbor, the Americans entered the war, and for the first time, the Chinese think, oh, we might win. <laughs> uh, having been on the receiving end since 1937 or, or even earlier. Um, and there are then a lot of things which come together. Uh, chapter seven of the book. Um, so you get, uh, let me call them Taiwanese or Chinese living in Taiwan, depending on how you want to construct it, um, who have lived under Japanese um, occupation, colonialism, you know, for the decades. A lot of them are well trained medical personnel. If they get training from Japanese, they then volunteer to go and fight um, on the nationalist or communist side. So you get the people who have an affinity with Taiwan, and so they start lobbying within the one day for you know um, restoring, restoring Taiwan to China, that kind of thing. Um, there is then a sort of also a recognition that strategically. Taiwan is also is important for the defense of China against foreign powers, whether they may be Japan or somebody else. And then you also get Yalta when Chiang Kai shek and Roosevelt and Churchill, no, sorry, Kai, no, uh, Chiang Kai shek um, meet. Um, Chiang Kai shek starts talking about getting Hong Kong back, and Churchill says, How about Taiwan? And let's keep Hong Kong. And it's a kind of, it's a, it's a bit of, he throws a bit of meat to Chiang Kai shek to divert him back Hong Kong. <laughs> so, I think we probably got time for maybe one more question. If there's anybody who'd like to. Um... Is anybody online? Yes, we can go. On the NIC broke this map, Korea was probably as the NIC The National Humiliation Map. Yes. Yes. Um, yes. I mean, it depends on the on the map and the and the and the author. Um, but I mean, here you have a mixing of uh, the idea of tributary states with part of the empire, um, and so you can see on some of these maps that um, you know Korea is regarded as having been a tributary state um, of the old order, um, which was taken by Japan, and obviously these you know, these are bits which have been found in China by Russia, by Russia, and then you know. Um, British, um, this is probably the most extensive one. We really kind of take the they take the idea of tributary states to the um, most bizarre extreme, you know, claiming that you know, Kazakhstan, you know, this is Iran, you know, kind of pretty much everything, you know, with the, you know, Brunei, and if Brunei included then you know, the Sultan, the Sultan of Sulu, the 
and therefore this line includes everything. Um, so they're all kind of um, ideas. You know, a lot of these are produced by commercial um, presses, um, people who are sort of out to, you know, apart from educate people to sell things, books, maps, atlases, and things. And so the more sort of dramatic maybe they can make them, the maybe the more sales they expect. So it's, it's, it's not like these are sort of necessarily state backed maps showing territorial claims. They're the work of individual authors and presses and cartographers. Who are trying to educate the masses about um, about humiliation? So, um, and if you, I, I, I kind of I've got them all, but I mean, if you kind of get into the, uh, the small chat uh, here, we kind of describe, you know, which are the you know, states which have been uh, grabbed by force and, and all the rest of it. So they are there are slightly different classifications in, in some of them. Alice has just reminded me there could be people online who okay. lined up, so I'm just going to try. Uh -huh. I think I didn't I mentioned at the end was that Zhang Qiyun becomes part of Chiang Kai-shek's kind of inner advisory circle. And it's actually him that in sort of 49 when they're looking when they probably decide where to retreat or you go. There's a sort of island to go to uh Taiwan and sort of hide on the mainland or go to Taiwan, he's the one that comes up uh, with the idea of well, so Taiwan is will be the best place for the Russian mm -hmm. uh, to go and um, Yes. Some comments on uh, or a question. That is it. If, from some, somebody's asking a question, and I'll just read it out. The dashed line in the nine dashed lined map that the South China Sea has always struck me as an unusual cartographic feature. In your research, was this convention applied in any other Chinese map? Did it have a single meaning or multiple meanings? And um, there's a question about whether it's affected by on loss, but just to say that the UN Convention on Law of the Sea is about claims to resources, it's not about, about territory. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, yeah, if we yeah. can go through um, scroll down a bit. One of the other maps, yes, that one there. This one, yeah. Yes. The next one. Uh, right. So, yeah, I mean, this this map was. Uh, I mean, Plan uh, Chu was the first person to draw a map like this. Other people had drawn maps with lines in the South China Sea, but they had only. Gone around the, the Parasol Islands here. Um, he was the first person to draw a line that went all the way down here. And it, it, this might have just been a historical oddity, except for the fact that two of his students, uh, who then go on to study in Germany and Japan in the 1930s, and you can imagine the kind of geography you learn in Japan, Germany and Japan in the 1930s, um, then come back to China, uh, teaching in Chinese universities, and are then seconded. For the Chinese government uh, after the Second World War, and they take this map uh, into the committee meetings in September 1946, which then becomes the Chinese claim. Uh, so that's kind of why this map becomes important. Okay, thank you. And I'll just again have to just somehow come out of this. Yes, of course. There. So there's just a couple of other comments. Well, once again, thank you, Bill, for this. I think it's absolutely fascinating kind of reawakened in me sort of vague memories of studying Chinese history during this period. And I think it's just been a wonderful talk. So if we want to thank Bill uh, and then people are very welcome to come and yeah, books for sale over there, very reasonably priced. <laughs> and there's, you know, please come and help yourselves to drink and some nibbles. So thank you.